Hello. I like reading. Shomot story. The story of Shomot, taken from book 43C. We have yet to name it. Translation, Nick. First draft. At the age of 121, Shomot had resided in his palace of the kings for 20 years. Though the palace had taken 45 years to construct, and new additions had been added every year, Shomat was still not pleased with all that surrounded him. His palace was larger than any structure in the city, and the gardens of his palace were more beautiful than any of, of her living plants that the people had ever known. But Shomot demanded more of those who created his home and his gardens. Shomot sent messengers demanding that Lemash, the head, this word seems to define some kind of leader of the servants, although they never defined him as servants, uh, have to ask Dr. Watson, of his palace come to his gardens immediately, and Lemash obeyed. Yes, my king, what is it that you require of me? Do you see these bulbs of orange and leaves of brown that surround me? Of course, my king, they are unlike any that dwell in this cavern. Do you see the intricate stone that surrounds me? asked Shamat. Of course, there is none like them in the cavern. And Shamat suddenly became angry, cursing at his servants. Not really servants, but it'll have to do. And screaming at those in his, his presence. Who do you think that I am? Do you think I have never used the books to see the beauty that lies outside this cavern? I have written these books myself, e even while you have seen me trained by the Grand Master. And yet you act as though I should be pleased at the beauty that now surrounds me. Beauty that comes only from this cavern. This cavern of no light, no warmth, and no color. Do you think stone and darkness are all that I require? Who do you think that I am? My king... What is it that you ask of me? Bring me Grand Master Kendri Kenry. Together you will work, work in a writing sense, with him and create mo me more real beauty, or create for me real beauty. Roaring waters, colors beyond imagination, living creations, not stone. These are the gardens that I demand. Now go and bring them to me. Ah. They were talking about the the creepy cav- the dark cavern. I think the cavern dark- the, the dark cavern's the area next to those lanterns I saw. Or the furnaces or whatever. And so they created this blinking book that takes us to this age that's just designed to be artificially beautiful. So th they came from the previous age I was in and then came here. And so Lamash went to Kenry, Grand Master of the Guild of Writers. And together they created an age with a beauty that was beyond that which any man had seen before. And together they brought their king to the age, eight months, these are Janine months, after his request had been made. Shabbat was pleased with all that he saw, broad leaves of green and yellow, flowers of every color, and roaring waters of blue and turquoise, like the most colorful stones of Denis. And he promoted Lamash, as he was already had, I'm not sure about his promotion, but the word is fairly clear, and made Kenry his most prized Grand Master in all of Denis. Tremont spent every day on his new age, and he asked for more of them, and he asked his architects to provide structures on these ages. And while this happened, Shamat's brothers continued to grow more jealous, and their anger turned to rage. They had not been invited to live in the palace of their brother, and now, through the, uh, though multitudes of common citizens were invited to the gardens of Shomat, never once were they allowed to visit. And their hearts burned toward their king and brother. So it was that Shomat was sitting alone in his garden age when two creatures approached him. Though they resembled men, they walked on their arms and legs and moved quickly. Shamat was frightened upon seeing the creatures and immediately called for his guards. The creatures ran from the guards, but Shamat ordered his guards to follow them, and the guards obeyed. It was not until the next day that they returned. They claimed that they had seen a city with hundreds of these creatures living in it, conversing with one another and organizing armies. These armies lived inside the Garden Age of Shamat, and Shamat was very afraid. 
Shamat ordered the men who had seen the village to be put in prison, not sure of book or physical prison, for what they saw, and he called his most trusted advisor, Lamash, to his residence in the city. Upon hearing of the creatures and their organization, Lamash too was frightened. We have no choice but to burn the book, Lamash recommended. You know this age is not ours, if it is already inhabited. You know the rules of our writing, and of our books, and of our people. But Shomat's heart was not moved by the words of Lamash, and he grew more angry and enraged. The world was created by me, for me. If there are others who exist, they will have to be killed. It is Denis now. So Shamat ordered for his brothers to be brought into his palace, and he informed them of his dilemma. Shamat asked his brothers if they would kill those who lived in his garden ages, and he bribed them with talk of power and authority. And so they agreed, even though they hated their brother. And the brothers of Shamat traveled to the age, and went to the creatures to destroy them. But in talking with the creatures, they became convinced that the creatures should not be killed, but instead they should be used to destroy their brother. And so they devised a plan to kill their brother, the king. While Shamat waited in his palace in the city, his brothers appeared to him. We have finished, they announced. The creatures are all dead. Shamat was pleased to hear such words from his brothers. And on the outside, he showed love to them. My brothers, I have done much wrong to you. There have been many times that I have not treated you like even those who work in my palace, and I am sorry for these actions. But today you have proven that you do not hold anger like I do. You are better than me. You have shown me favor, and so I ask you accept what I have to offer you. Please accept this gift. And Shamat gave his brothers a linking book. Its pages were filled with descriptions of beauty and life, like Shamat's own garden age. And it will be kept here, in this palace, where you will live now. Filled with pleasure, and forgetting their hate for Shamat, his brothers went to the age quickly, and it was there that they died, thinking that they had fooled their brother. Shamat burned the book in his own fire, forever erasing his brothers and their deceit from his mind. Wow, great guy. And Shabbat ordered the Grand Master to change his garden age so that those who lived there would die. And Kenry obeyed the king even though he knew it was wrong. And his life was filled with turmoil until, turmoil until he died. But Shamat, though he did what was wrong, continued to live and pursue all that he wanted. The story continues, but it seemed a good point to stop. I'd like to go over this a few more times with some better translators, maybe even Dr. Watson. I've, I filled in a lot of words as best I could for now. I was going to look at the front page, but I have to pan back through them all. Uh, so what's the, that's the specific story. Where'd you translate it from? The hieroglyphs? Probably not. You're talking about individual words. So this is the... This is the age of a horrible king, basically. He had his own world, and it was already beautiful, but he didn't think that was enough, so he wanted another, more beautiful, artificial world. And then when he found out that he, that other people already lived here, he's like, well, kill them. Kill them all. And also, when his brothers envied what he wanted, he outsmarted them, tricked them into a, into a prison, and burned the book so they could never be returned. Uh, it's effect, not, not necessarily effectively killing them, but trapping them until their death, at the very least. Although a lot of these people would be, do a lot better if they just had the ability to create mist uh, linking books. I always want to say mist. They did try not to call the whole series mist. If you look at the ones made by Cyan, they made mist, riven, uru, mist five, and then abduction. Like, they only have actually called a game, uh, named a game, oh, hey, it really is like a koi pond. Mist 5 is the only time they really called it uh, a sequel by name, and so in a way that we usually do. They, they name drop it, though. 
because this was called Uru, Ages Beyond Mist, and Mist was called Mist, uh, I, mean, I mean Riven was called Riven, the sequel to Mist, but they weren't called Mist 2 and Mist 3 at first. It was Mist, Riven, Uru, Obduction. But, uh, the Ubisoft-controlled games were called Mist 3 and Mist 4, with the extra insulting name of Mist 4 Revelation, which I've gotten into before, but oh my god, Ubisoft used the word Revelation for three or four different games. Take me back, huh? Where? The same place? Seems like yes. Okay. I need a light source, though, if I'm going to be able to get inside where I'm trying to go. Unless I can just go for it. Maybe I just gotta commit. <laughs> I mean, worst case scenario, if I'm truly stuck, I can just use my linking book to get out. Let's just walk backwards for a while. I can just barely see that wall that I came from. Oh. Something right here. Like a pillar. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Whoa! Going by my lighting direction, there should be a light in the... Maybe not. There seemed to be a light coming from this direction. Oh shit, did I see an interactive spot back here? Is this where I came from? Yeah. So I didn't go very far. But if you're in third person, you can at least kind of see your character. Not easy. That's the entrance. Is that... I might just be hitting the boundary of my own character a little bit. I just really thought that I saw it fill in. This is obviously not working. Can't even see my own character at the moment. Not even that part's working. I'm just curious, these are obviously a light source. There's not much by the in not much indication that I can interact or bring like these are torches. Those are explicitly torches. Why can't I grab a torch? Curse you, mist protagonists, and the way that you guys don't pick up items. Because like in many ways, mist games are almost point-and-click adventure games, but they have one really weird quirk, which is that they don't really pick up objects. Like, I have a linking book, and the key, and another book, which is my journal. I don't- they don't ever pick up objects, really. Even the collectibles in this game are journeys that you just touch for a second, and then it's like, you have it now! So like, even when you have a torch, and a seemingly a fire- hello! 
those don't combine into you uh, being able to carry a torch. These are usually really pointless, but I'll look either way. Might be pretty at least. Oh, this is a new place that looks like it's full of documentation. Oh my god. Where is this? Whoa. The stone ha chiller font. New album in stores now at Tigris. Are they all? Get a chance to look around a little bit. Why are there so many journals? Whoa. King Najin. King Azimleth. King Ailish. They're, these are all by Sam. They seem to be translations. Are these also Sam's? Or... So you do Sam. DRC. Linguistus 20... Linguistus 242 Intro into Meaning. Yeah, now it's TRC. It was like this guy, it's like he had this from back when he was in a... In college? Learning how to translate and stuff. These ones don't have names. They, see, they look like the same font though. But the guy who translated the other thing I saw was Nick. The manhole. Marriage? Michelle. Whoa. Maturity? So we have at least two people, Sam and Michelle. Pregnancy. What does it say? Trisha, right? Class system. Might be our chance of learning about Mist or the Denia's a world. Hello. Check this out. I know the DRC doesn't want us to touch these, but I bet Watson would like to know how these register with the doors, too. It makes no sense. And don't lose it. I could barely get it off the wall, and when I did, it was pretty scary. Maybe the weirdest thing is that when I went back later, the cloth I got this piece from was intact again. Nick. What? So this is like a hand thing. They took it off and then it just came back. It's like Nick was, Nick tried to take one of the journeys. So I imagine that one doesn't work anymore because it's been removed. But the one that he took it from just came back. Is that a, is that a lunch bag? Gross. King Mayaman. Don't seem to have this one's typed. King Karath. How long are these stories? Not not mega long. But a bunch of stories. Where the heck is my book? And why did someone take it in the first place? Nick. So we have Nick, Sam, Trisha, and Michelle. Matthew, the last batch of papers you sent were very interesting. Since you, since you did such a good job, I've got another list I'd like you to divvy up to the team. How you do it is up to you. One, I'd like some more information on family life, ceremonies, etc. Anything related to birth, marriage, cultural events. I know we have a lot, uh, we have quite a bit of source material for this, so anything that you get would be helpful. I think we've gathered quite a bit on science and technology, and not enough on the personal lives of these people. 
We have quite a bit of guild information, but gathering that all up into one tiny area would be nice. The fall is still an obvious area we are, where we are lacking. I'm not sure I can help you with research material, but given the latest information that we are getting, at some time, we are going to have to dig into this. I recommend assigning someone to the sole task of the fall. Or continue on with the kings. A short synopsis of all the kings would be uh, helpful following the form you started with the last batch. We still have religious writings we need to translate. These are going to be the most difficult, but I think they can give us a large amounts of helpful information. We have a stack of journals from various Denis residences, etc., not to mention ages. I think that will be more than enough for now. Again, thank your team and tell them we are doing great work. Dr. Watson. Oh, I just put the... Yep, I've got a hard hat on. <laughs> that was wearable. So this is where they were doing the grunt work. This is like their office or gathering location. Like these are all the different journals of all the different uh, people that were doing like translation and archaeological and historical work around here. A lot of uh, maybe interesting but definitely time consuming accounts on a bunch of kings and their stories. We'll see if I get to those. It seems like a significant amount of text to dump on me all at once. Definitely gonna probably start with the ones that are about their rituals and marriage and so on. Because those those tell larger stories than just one character's uh, backstory. Now I've got another hard head on. So many clothing options. Can I climb this? Lantern. It's not freaking hard, protagonist. Just grab the lantern and take it with us. What's wrong with you? It's right here. Just pick it up. We need a light in the other room. Like, at some point, you gotta be proactive, you know? Like, crap. <laughs> How much do I have to deal with picking up after your crap? Just, he doesn't want to, he doesn't want to succeed. <laughs> and I'm stuck with him. Oh, that's real low res down there. You're not supposed to look at that room down there. You know, this is an interesting place to keep track of. And now I should have a warp point that takes me straight here. Hey, where were you guys? Hey, what is this? The manhole. <clears throat> Sorry. Let me double check real quick. Just gonna Google this. I think the manhole was Cyan's first game. Or one they worked on in the past. Yeah. Manhole looks like a game from 1988. It's an adventure video game from 1988. Uh, manhole is an adventure video game in which the player opens a manhole and reveals a gigantic beanstalk leading to a fantastic worlds. CD-ROM Masterpiece Edition is the thumbnail I see. So definitely, definitely way back there. Actually, it was it was brought to Steam in 2007. I might have a copy of it, actually. I definitely thought that I recognized the game. So I wanted to check. So what is this thing full of? Oh. It's a story, but it's explaining marriage. It just happens to have the manhole, like, as a branded cover. That's what that reference is for. Called back to old Cyan. Ah, the manhole copyright 1988 at Cyan Incorporated. Huh. Oh yeah, it just straight up has Cyan's logo there. I didn't notice that at first. That's interesting. Uh, I mean, if you look at it, canonically, uh, Cyan Studios visited this location. They visited, uh, I always want to call it Uru, but it's not. This place is like Teladon or something, or Tele... Uh, but they visited this age and the DRC. Uh, the, the, the brothers weren't even name-dropped in that previous journal, so... 
they may have actually been like, ha, ah, yeah, here, check these out. And they, they might have like brought some merch with them and handed it out. And then that merch was used as, as journals, fittingly enough. Marriage. Much more than modern cultures, within Dini culture, all citizens were expected to marry. In fact, it was even believed that marriage was an important part of a relationship with Yavo, as it taught and revealed the necessary requirements for such a relationship. Both marriage relationships and the relationship with Yavo were described by the same Dini word, Taigan. Literally translated, the word means to love with the mind and implied a deep understanding, respect, and most importantly, unselfish love for one another. Obviously, the religious influence of, on most Dini culture was very strong, and as a result, marriage was not something taken lightly. It was considered a lifetime commitment, and for a Dini who could live up to be 300 years old, it was obviously not a decision the Dini felt should be rushed into, and it seems as though it rarely was. Some records point to rare arranged marriages, although for the most part it seems that the decision was up to individuals. Marriage was not permitted before the age of 25, and marriage between blood relatives was strictly forbidden. Though allowed, marriage between the classes was looked down upon. Marriage to other worlders was practically unheard of. I have found certain writings from the 9000s going so far as to call the mixing of Denis blood with outside cultures as travesty while others wrote such a child who marries an outsider was better off dead. Wow. The Denis are great, you know? Like, they're a bunch of racists. They, they like, hey, children might as well die. Uh, then there's all the kings we were always hearing about full of greed and whatnot. Uh, what a shock their society fell down. By the way, Michelle, you're going to be the downfall of our society if you don't learn to write on the lines, goddammit. <laughs> Nobody in, the, none of these people write on the lines and their spiral notebook, like, why, why are there any of their notebooks? Why, 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 did the, why even get lined paper if you're not going to use it? The marriage ceremony itself was not a single day event, but one that took over five days. Attendance to these sections of the ceremony to which one was invited was extremely important, and it was considered a disgrace to be invited and not attend. The event usually began with a small ceremony held on the evening before the first day of the marriage ceremony. The ceremony always took place at the home of the groom or his parents, and was meant to confirm both the bride and groom's decision to be united to one another in front of their immediate family. The groom presented his bride-to-be with a gift representing the confirmation of his choice. The acceptance of the gift was uh, by the bride-to-be was acknowledged acknowledgement of her decision. Immediately after accepting acceptance of the gift, the bride-to-be was escorted away with her family and not to be seen by her groom until the joining ceremony that would take place on the fifth day. The fifth day was meant for the bride and groom to spend time with their families. The, sorry, the first day. Yeah. The first day was meant for the bride and groom to spend time with their families. As they were starting their own family, their old family would no longer be the highest priority. Thus, the day was set aside to spend time with that originally fa original family. Traditionally, the day ended with a large meal, as well as speeches and blessings from the parents to the child. The second day was set aside for the bride and groom to spend with friends, both married and unmarried. Traditionally, one of the friends would host a large dinner at the end of the day. The third day was reserved for spending time with the uh, soon-to-be-in-laws. It was on the day that the bride and groom received blessings from their in-laws as well as other members of the family. Again, there was a traditional larger meal at the end of the day marked by speeches from the eventual in-laws and other soon-to-be family members. The fourth day was meant for the couple to spend time alone with Yavo individually. Though many apparently viewed the day as a formality, others viewed it as the most significant of all the days. The day was often filled with prayer, asking for Yavo's blessings upon the event, as well as a time to understand Yavo's desires for their new lives together. It was also considered a time to purify themselves before Yavo. Some chose to spend time with the priests or prophets, while others read the holy books and talked to Yavo himself. The first day was the day of joining. 
the early portion of the day was set aside for physical preparation, while the later part of the day was set aside for the joining ceremony itself. For those that did not have access to private ages, the ceremony usually took place on the marriage ages. For the upper classes, the ceremony took place in the family ages. All family was expected to attend, as were fellow guild members. All those in attendance were divided into two sides. One side represented the, blo the groom, while the other represented the bride. Between the two sides, in the center, were a long aisle and a triangular podium. The bride and groom would each approach their side of the podium by walking through their respective family and friends. It was, after all, those family and friends who made the bride and groom what they were. And the, the Dene believed it was those family and friends who should present their bride or groom to this, their spouse. The priestess would uh, usually stood on the third side of the podium. As with most important events, the and especially marriage, the bride and groom wore the braces they had been given at birth as well as maturity. After the bride and groom arrived to the platform, the father of the bride would remove the bride's bracelets and give them to their groom. The Dene believed the giving of the bracelets rep represented the giving of the bride's purity and adulthood to the groom. A short speech often followed the event. The father of the groom would follow the father of the bride with the identical procedure giving his son to the bride. The giving of the children was followed by an expression of both parents of their blessings upon those being joined, as well as, uh, as all of those present. Symbolically, the bride and groom then switched sides to represent an acceptance of all the bride's family and friends and the groom and vice versa. Both the bride and groom then handed all four braces to the priests. The priestess. While the priestess led the couple through their co their commu uh, commitments to one another on Yavo, the bride and groom placed their hands upon the podium. During the commitments, the couple made promises to one another, followed by promises to Yavo. All were recited aloud to the priestess. The priestess usually reminded the couple that marriage was a, re a re reminder of Taigan to know with, a, uh, with the mind, and that their love should always be a representation of their love for Yavo. Following the commitments, the priest would place two new and larger bracelets upon the bride and groom. The groom was placed upon the left wrist and the bride on the right wrist. The new bracelets were meant to represent both the purity and maturity bracelets they, their spouse had previously worn. The Denis emphasized that the spouse was now your responsibility to keep pure and knowledgeable of good and evil. The bracelets were meant to be a constant reminder of that responsibility as well as a commitment to maintain the best for that spouse. Yeah, based on what I've heard so far about this universe, everything about the supposed purity and good and evil and watchfulness and mindfulness seems to have not really always made it through past formalities. Uh, you know, with the slavery and the kings and the all the nightmarish things that people do. And, uh... Admittedly, almost every single descendant of the Dene I've ever met uh, was basically trying to murder people or do some other bad thing, basically. Uh, the number of... Uh, especially learning about more of them in this in this game, but also the antagonists of the, pre of the previous games and whatnot. Uh, not the best hit record, at least. After the new bracelets were placed upon the wrists, the hands of the bride and groom were wrapped together with a tight cord covering the wrists and hands completely. Upon completion, the priest placed a ring upon the pinky of each free hand. The rings were symbolic reminders of the entire ceremony and placed upon the fifth finger to represent the joining that took place on the fifth day. The priestess would then usually remove herself from the podium so that the couple could take her place. Together, the couple then walked down the aisle between the two parties and toward the far end of the aisle where a glass of wine waited for them. Before drinking, the couple knelt and prayed together to Yavo. After the prayer, they each drank from the cup and the two sides of the hall merged into one group, often with great celebration. They were now considered joined and celebration could begin. 
Family is usually fed, all in attendance, and there were typically dancing and music. The couple was expected to keep their hands uh, united throughout the night as a reminder that they were now joined both in the eyes of man and Yavo. The binding of the hands was apparently meant to be somewhat troublesome, symbolizing that there would be difficult times to their relationship, but that those times did not affect the fact that they were now joined. Following the celebrations, tradition was for uh, the couple to embrace and the priestess to touch a linking book to them so that they would both link to vacation or honeymoon type ages. Though these vacations were uh, usually short, it was not unusual for the man to not work for up to a year in order to build the new marriage. I should also note that the cord used to join the couple's hands together was also viewed as a sacred item. It seems as though various couples used the cords in a variety of different ways, some using them for necklaces, others for uh, hanging them in their house. Alright, I'm googling something again. Let's see. I'm gonna... I, I think it's Muslim. Tying hands marriage. Is that the right one? I don't know if it's... Uh, let's remove Muslim. That was just a guess. There's a... There's definitely an existing... Oh, it seems to be listed here under Celtic. And fasting. With arms extended, they clasped hands and braided cord of ribbon was wrapped and tied around their hands. There might be more examples of that. Just kind of looking into the idea of like how many, because definitely that's definitely an idea that shows up already outside of mist. That's curious. Yeah, it's de there's definitely existing examples of that, of that idea. Mm -hmm.